Just last week, California Energy Commission and the University of California released a roadmap study and found that with appropriate policy support, the renewable hydrogen sector can reach self-sustainability, price point at parity with conventional fuel on a fuel economy adjusted basis by the mid to late 2020. We are very excited to have such and California partners here today to talk about the future of integrated hydrogen energy systems and the role of mobility in these efforts. And Karin, you are here the innovation attaché at the consulate here in San Francisco. I would like to hand over the moderating role to you. Thank you, Herbert. Thank you for opening. Thank you all for your um, attendance um, and for joining us. And thanks to our speakers today. Um, I have the honor of being your moderator. My name is Karen, and this webinar is the first in a uh, first step in a broader exploration of potential collaboration in this field between the Netherlands and California, hopefully next time in person. Um, we have six speakers today, quite a tight program. Um, just a word to attendees, if you would like to submit a question, please do so in the Q&A box. I will ask speakers to unmute themselves um, when uh, it's their turn to speak. And let's get started with our first speaker. We have Ms. Carla Robledo, um, Senior Policy Advisor at the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy in the Netherlands. Carla, please unmute yourself. Thank you, Karen. Um, yes, so today I would like to present to you the Netherlands and European perspective on clean hydrogen. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the main drivers for clean hydrogen in the Netherlands? I would like to point out four of the main drivers, and that is basically the existing hydrogen production in the Netherlands, which is quite large, 175 petajoules per year. And that is fossil uh, based and it's great hydrogen. So we need to clean this, uh, make this hydrogen cleaner. There's also a large offshore wind potential at the North Sea uh, for combining with um, electrolyzers for producing green hydrogen. And there's a large existing gas infrastructure, uh, not only on land, but also offshore, um, with also the know-how related to it, uh, which can be reutilized for clean hydrogen. And the last but not least, the geographical conditions are also quite uh, favorable in the Netherlands with the uh, salt layers in the northern Netherlands for hydrogen uh, storage, but also the empty fields and uh, the large uh, inf uh, infrastructure for the ports, which can allow import and export of hydrogen. Next slide, please. So uh, the Dutch Climate Agreement has as main goal to achieve 49% CO2 reduction in 2030. And hydrogen plays a prominent role in this uh, climate agreement with emissions of three to four uh, gigawatts of electrolysis capacity by 2030. And uh, in particular for mobility in 2025, 50 tank stations, 15,000 fuel cell electric vehicles and 3,000 heavy duty vehicles. Next slide. Um, so these ambitions were crystallized this year in the National Hydrogen Strategy, which we presented to the Dutch Parliament in March. Um, with We highlighted the systemic role that hydrogen, clean hydrogen, will play in a zero carbon energy supply, um, pointing out the unique start position of the Netherlands, um, also announcing a national hydrogen program, which will start in 2022. Uh, with extra financial support for upscaling the first 100 megawatts of electrolysis for green hydrogen production. And we basically pointed out uh, four policy, uh, four pillars in the policy agenda, which I would like to briefly mention in the next slide, please. And so we basically focus on legislation and regulation, what needs to be addressed regarding the existing gas grids, uh, guarantees of origin, certification, safety, uh, cost reduction and scaling up of hydrogen, sustainability of final consumption, and uh, supporting thinking policy related to international and regional uh, strategies. Next slide. And we are not alone, uh, the Netherlands, in this uh, in pursuing clean hydrogen. In Europe, there are uh, other countries uh, with national uh, ambitions. Also, last week, uh, Germany presented their national strategy. Um, and the hydrogen road in Europe is what's established that hydrogen can play a large role, uh, almost a quarter of its final energy demand can be supplied with hydrogen, providing large annual CO2 abatements, large annual revenues, uh, reducing CO uh, NOx emissions uh, related to road transport and creating large amounts of jobs. 
So clean hydrogen has a, a great role in unlocking the potential of off and onshore wind resources in um, Northern Europe, but also solar wind resources in Southern Europe and Northern Africa. Um, it has the potential to connect uh, all European uh, countries with its existing gas infrastructure, providing large scale energy storage and security of supply and um, supplying hard to abate sectors such as the petrochemical and chemical industry, steel production, the electricity balancing plants for mobility, for the hydrogen fueling infrastructure that is needed, and also in the built environment for regional hydrogen distribution grids. Uh, I would like to point out that uh, clean hydrogen plays a pivotal role in the European Green Deal, which was presented in December 2019. Uh, also, uh, important projects of common European interest, IPSE, uh, as a role for hydrogen for new and novel value chains. And in and, and the situation we are now living, also the economic recovery package had a strong uh, focus on wind, solar, but also kickstarting a clean hydrogen economy in Europe with large uh, financial support. And I would like to also point out that at the beginning of July, uh, the Clean Hydrogen Alliance and European strategy will be presented. So with this, the next slide, please. And I would like to point out the main challenges that we are uh, encountering here in the Netherlands and uh, in Europe is to obtain. Uh, we need cleaner hydrogen. The cost needs to fall uh, for hydrogen production, but also for the whole entire supply chain. And on and offshore uh, infrastructure needs to be developed. We need to create a liquid hydrogen market and regulatory barriers need to be addressed. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you and uh, back to you, Karen. Thank you, Carla, for your presentation. First presentation on policy from the Dutch perspective within the European framework as well. And thank you for, for your presentation. We'll have a little short little Q&A after the next speaker from the California side and talking about the policy efforts there. We have Mr. Tyson Eckerly, the Deputy Director of Zero Emission Vehicle Market Development at uh, GoBiz in California. Tyson, um, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Great, thank you very much, Karen. Well, yeah, we're excited to share what we've learned here in California. We have a lot of work to do, but we made a lot of good progress. And really it comes down to collaboration and working across um, government and industry. You can go to the next slide. So I wanted to start with just kind of some current market statistics where we are. There's a map of California kind of, and you can see the dots on the map are where our stations are. We have 41 stations that are open to the public now and 18 that are in development. And that has enabled about 8,400 uh, fuel cell vehicles to be either bought or sold in, in California. So if you go to the next slide there, um, so that's the light duty side. On the heavy duty side, we're really excited. And you'll hear from Salvador later too, but we have four heavy duty bus stations, uh, 48 fuel cell electric buses, and three heavy duty um, stations that'll uh, support uh, fuel cell electric trucks. We have about 10 or so in development. Um, and so the, the number is a little bit more fluid there, so I didn't include it. But so that we're just getting started on the heavy duty side and have a lot of work to do there and a lot of excitement. Let me go to the next slide. Um, so, so this is by looking back at the light duty. So on the right hand side of the slide, you'll see this is consumption of hydrogen starting from the beginning of our network until the, about 2019. So this is pre-COVID. After COVID, we had a bit of a dip in consumption. But you can see that you know, it's been growing consistently through time um, as more and more cars and stations come online. Um, if you look at the left, there, these are some of the pictures. Like these are lines of fuel cell vehicles lined up at the stations. And one of my favorite quotes is from uh, a, you know European executives who came over and couldn't believe that there was as much throughput at their station. They looked at the line of cars and they, you know the, the line was you know we should have built a bigger station. And so that's kind of where we are now. That to, you know to, the first stations had one dispenser. The ones coming in the future have four dispensers. And so there's. It's really constrained only by the station size and capacity as far as the market goes. So you can go to the next slide. And so, you know, kind of to create that environment, you know, it's kind of what is the secret sauce? And I looked up, okay, what's, you know, according to, you know, one of our, our magazines here, and, and I agree with it, Sriracha sauce is very popular in California. We have a factory here. And then I'm going to butcher the name, but I think it's Frita sauce or something for the Netherlands, you know, for the tops of the fries. So, so yeah, there's secret sauce everywhere. But if you go to the next slide, um, you know, really what underpins kind of what's working. First, you have the foundation of our, our policy environment. And so we have policies, I won't go through all the detail here, but that support 
the vehicles, and that's really underscored by our zero emission vehicle regulation that the California Air Resources Board does. We have support on the station, so grant funding that's you know been provided by the California Energy Commission, and we have fuel support as well through you know through the, both the capital grants and some electricity rates type of work, which we have some uh, work to do on. Um, but really, the focus is on trying to get that whole you know um, circle working together, where we're supporting all three pillars. Um, if you go to the next slide, I think what really what the secret sauce has is that, you know, it's, it's collaboration, but it's also that startup mentality. So the California Fuel Cell Partnership has been around for a little over 20 years now, and it's made up of industry and government partners. And that's really where people have come together to solve problems to make this stuff happen, because it's been, you know, each barrier that we've had to overcome, it's because of the trust that's been built in that room over time that help, you know, solve it together from coming from each perspective. But a, you know, a couple of documents on the left side. So there's a California roadmap that was published in 2012, and it kind of gave an idea okay, to launch, launch the light to be market. What do we need in, in terms of stations? Where do they need to go? And that was really what catalyzed our policy development within the legislature and governor's office to really push this market forward. And then the, the next document is one that came out a couple of years later. Oh, actually, this sorry, back to that first one slide. I'm sorry about that. The fuel cell revolution that's really looking towards the future you know like in 2030 what where do we want to be it's you know a thousand stations it's um, a million cars but then if you on the right side i have this a picture of first element fuel and that's one of the four dispenser um, stations but first element fuel saw the opportunity and so they kind of things um, needing to bring together both uh you know, automotive and government support to help catalyze the station. And there's a startup from California, but because they came together and pushed this market forward, they really opened doors for everybody else to jump in. Um, if we go to the next slide. And so we're trying to recreate that magic on the heavy duty sector. Salvador's done a ton at AC Transit. Um, we have the advanced clean truck rule regulation that is being, that's coming to the Air Resources Board on June 25th, which would basically underpin the market in terms of making sure that uh, manufacturers have to bring zero emission vehicles. We have a, a fleet rule that we'll be following so that the fleets, larger fleets would have to purchase those vehicles. And then we have active grant program investments from the Energy Commission and Air Resources Board really pushing this market. Um, the fuel cell partnership and kind of mirroring the light duty side has done a fuel cell electric bus roadmap and they're working on a fuel cell electric truck roadmap to help, help um, set the foundation from where we're going. And if you go to the next slide, so we really see these markets as synergistic, you know, light duty, and the, there's a lot of the detail on here, but light duty essentially drives up the volume on components and then heavy duty drives up, drives up the volume on hydrogen supply to bring down the cost on both ends. So the components support the heavy duty development, the heavy duty supports the, that fuel consumption. Because one of us, as Carla mentioned, you know, one of the biggest challenges is making sure that we bring down the cost of the fuel. We go to the next slide. Um, and so, you know, if you look in, so we've done a lot of work and focus on mobility and our policy framework is really strong, but we have a lot of work to do in terms of looking at hydrogen as an energy carrier. And right now our policy is kind of being led regionally in a way. So Los Angeles Department of Water and Power is one of the more exciting projects where they're trying to decommission a coal plant that's in Utah um, and, and wheels power into the Los Angeles basin. They want to replace that coal with um with natural gas and ultimately hydrogen. Um, and there's beautiful salt caverns that can store hydrogen there. So they would capture the solar energy and the wind energy and then send that power back to Los Angeles. So that's, you know, kind of capturing the imagination of policymakers here, but really, you know, we don't have a comprehensive state hydrogen energy plan. It's loosely fitting into a bunch of our other policies, but there's a lot of opportunity. And I think we have a lot to learn from what is happening in Europe. So we go to the next slide. So the opportunity, you know, we still, we have very strong policies setting the direction and this is the opportunity for hydrogen to kind of, to come in and deliver on it. So we have a bill that's passed is SB 100, which, you know, dictates that we have to get to hundred percent carbon free electricity by 2045, which is a big opportunity. Uh, Governor Brown in 2019 signed an executive order, you know, organizing us towards a carbon free economy. So not just the electricity sector by 2045 and then Governor Newsom has a, you know, not backed off and has been aggressive on that as well. And that's, you know, his, his executive order there at the bottom. And we go to the next slide. 
there. And so, you know, really, if you look going ahead, I think we, what we've learned is, you know, it, it takes collaboration across both industry and, and government, but really to never underestimate the power of us, you know, a small company or, or, or a big company for that matter, to really catalyze the market and get us going. That, and that top picture there is that first element thing with there's, you know, we've had great contributions from Shell, from Toyota, from Iwatani and EPS, all across, all across the way. And so if we go to the next slide. We have two minutes remaining. Oh. Great. And this, that's it. So that's my, that's my contact information. And then one more slide just kind of shows the people in the California Fuel Cell Partnership who have helped build out this market. And I, and I can go right back to you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Tyson. Amazing timing. Well done. Um, I think it's interesting to see that the focus in California has really been on um, the, the transportation side. While in the Netherlands, it's been a more broader implementation of hydrogen in, in, in the, uh, the infrastructure, especially in the northern Netherlands. So we're going to hear about some of those broader integrated approaches in the next two talks. But we do have a few questions that we have time for. Um, one that you've eloquently answered already, why is California so successful? Your special sauce. Uh, but maybe, Tyson, for you, um, uh, you recently said in a New York Times article that fuel cell vehicles, in particular for, the, for, for um, people transportation, could really help democratize the shift in electrification in a way that um, electric vehicles have not been able to do. C could you elaborate on that? I think that, you know, there's big opportunities. So we see, you know, battery electric and fuel cell electric as incredibly complementary technologies. I think in terms of democratization that the ability to get hydrogen energy into those densely populated regions really makes a big difference, you know, fueling up in five minutes. Um, one of the most challenging areas to get market penetration is in the multifamily dwellings. And in California, on average, we have at least half of our population in multifamily. If you get go to a city like San Francisco, I think it's closer to 60%. And so we have three stations in San Francisco, three hydrogen stations. So we see a big opportunity there. Um, really, it's just trying to meet people where they are in terms of fuel. If they have a driveway to plug into, let's get them in a battery electric car as much as possible. And if they don't, let's make sure we have options for them. Excellent. So it's not an or, it's an and, and situation. Um, um, maybe for both of you, a question, and you just, and one of you just mentioned it briefly as well, is, of course, the global crisis really has created some extreme fluctuations in the oil price. Do you anticipate any um, issues here in, in short term or maybe even long term effects on the energy transition? And maybe Carla first. Yes. Um, well, yes, not only the oil prices have uh, gone low, but also the gas prices have uh, reached very low prices. And that will definitely have an, an impact on uh, blue hydrogen development and clean hydrogen development. Um, but the focus in Europe uh, with the recovery plans is to really focus on uh, clean uh, technologies and foment them with stimulating them with uh, extra uh, financial uh, support. Um, so we don't want to uh, stop the developments. Uh, on the contrary, we want to stimulate them and really uh, have a green recovery plan from the crisis. Thank you. Tyson, any any thoughts on that? Just that that you know, the cheaper gas prices makes it more difficult to get people to say yes to get into a, a zero emission vehicle. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. that's the main thing that we're keeping an eye on. But we have yeah. currently automakers support you know fueling for the first three years and most of the lease programs or purchase programs for hydrogen. So you have it buys a little bit of time, but it just makes it more challenging. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to move on to the next speaker. Um, we have Petri Knubben, um, who represents the LNG and hydrogen portfolio at the New Energy Coalition in the Netherlands. Um, Petri, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. And Yeah. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I would say, like to say hello, California. Hello, San Francisco. And thank you to the Consulate General of the Netherlands for inviting us to explain the actions we are undertaking in our region to uh, well, actually become the first hydrogen valley in Europe with a fantastic name called Heaven, and who don't want to be there in, the, in Heaven, but let me, let me get to, to it and try to give you a, an overview in the short time we have. And thank you for the audience for, uh, well, looking and hearing to us. Okay, may I have the next slide, please? Uh, 
Well, this is this is uh, in the in the yellow circle. It's the region where uh, we're in. It's comprising of the three northern provinces of the Netherlands: Friesland, Groningen, and Drenthe. You might have heard of it. About 1.7 million inhabitants. About 10 percent of the inhabitants of the Netherlands. About 25 percent of the land area of the Netherlands, which you can see there. On top of the yellow circle is the North Sea, which will become a very big energy park with a lot of offshore windmills um, planted in it. And the power will come on shore. And there the, the rationale for becoming a hydrogen valley will instantaneously become reality because the power will come in such tremendous amounts that it cannot be redistrib redistributed by the power lines. So what do you do with the power you harvest? Well, actually, you're going to tin it. You're going to can it into hydrogen using electrolysis and then use the, electron, the, the, the hydrogen in the, the downstream markets, industry, mobility, and the urban housing, the low heat uh, sector. May I have the next slide, please? Next slide, please. Yeah. The, the, the northern region has be, be become particularly um, well known around the world in the gas sector because of the uh, availability of the Groningen gas field. And the Groningen gas field uh, has brought us a lot of, uh, let's say, prosperity and wealth in the Netherlands, but also some, some minor, uh, um, let's say, effects like, like little earthquakes, which um, have resulted in the effect that this gas field will run down to a zero production in the foreseeable future uh, in 2023. So in this graph, on the top, you will see the cumulative amount of natural gas extracted from this one field. And on the, the graph underneath, you can see the effect the gas exploitation and gas, uh, uh, let's say, market has on the regional economy in our region. So shutting down this field will, uh, will in the end, mean that the regional econ economic, um, uh, the regional domestic product will go down 10, 12% more about. So this region is quite dependent on gas, has a lot of gas experience, but when the gas is gone, the money is gone, then the, this will create some, let's say, societal challenges. Uh, so we have the next slide. We have a plan. And the plan is called turning the region into a green hydrogen economy, a green hydrogen region. And it's called the green hydrogen economy of the Northern Netherlands. We described this little booklet, which can be made available via, let's say, via the uh, digital way. Three years ago, together with Professor Ed van Wyk, who has been a driving force for that, and we have taken that and made the next step. May I have the next slide, please? Um, the industry in our region, and on the right-hand side, you can see the three provinces, Friesland, Groningen on top, Drenthe underneath. And the industries there have set together and have defined a plan. And the plan is conceptuated in an investment agenda Hydrogen Northern Netherlands, apologies, in, it's in Dutch. Um, and it comprises of, a, of an investment plan of about 3, million, 3 billion euros to decarbonize this industry using electrification, but also using hydrogen. And this uh, is very interesting because the industry has said, we're going to do it. This. this is what we want. And that's had, that has brought us to, may I have the next slide, please? To um, look how we can combine all the aspects which, which need to be in place to become a hydrogen economy. We think our region is perfectly located because of this big knowledge about natural gas exploration, transfer, and usage. We have a lot of energy coming in from the North Sea, in particular offshore wind. We have a very extended um, chemical industry, which is based on salt and natural gas. And these are key ingredients to make a step towards hydrogen. We have a very good gas infrastructure, large scale underground storages, salt caverns, etc. as Mr. Eckley uh, noted uh, uh, very well. May I have the next slide, please? Um, and we have the potential to scale up uh, and export, produce and export green hydrogen to the Netherlands itself, so it's more an import thing, but also to other EU regions. So, and we can uh, continue the ongoing decarbonization of mobility and because we have several universities and uh, universities of applied sciences in our context, we can utilize this knowledge to make a next step. May I have the next slide, please? So in essence, what we are going to do, we are going to uh, uh, 
run of this graph from the left hand side where there are some trucks some buses some some um some fueling stations into a deep integration of hydrogen into society in industry mobility and housing that's the right hand side and this pathway is actually the pathway we want to uh walk together with this hydrogen valley project called heaven may I have the next slide please these are all the active participants in the project, 31, um, uh, comprised of big companies, small companies, SMEs, a big portion of, of it is SMEs, a public transport authority like, like uh, Owen uh, is representing is also involved via the Q bus link, the bus operator. So a lot of parties uh, um, which have put their shoulder on it, under it. There are 31 parties from seven European countries. And we are very happy to, to also mention that uh, the California Fuel Cell Partnership is, is an observer. A region from New Zealand, the Taranaki region, is an observer. And the Scottish uh, Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Association is also an observer. And we invite actively people, parties who want to become an observer, make yourselves noticed because we want to reach out to you. We want to share our knowledge and we want to share our experiences. And not in the least because... Um, uh, we have been uh, we've been received a substantial co-funding from the fuel cell and hydrogen joint undertaking as a part of the EU. Um, uh, so our, our big thanks to them as well to to help us make this step. May I have the next slide, please? And actually, actually in industry, we are going to um, install uh, quite some electrolyzers up to 100 megawatt in total. 20 megawatt will be used to power up a green methanol production. Another 40 megawatt unit will uh, be used to produce green kerosene, a drop in e-fuel, we are calling that. In total, uh, we can produce about 2,800 tons a year, and that will run up to about 7,500 tons a year within six years. So that's the industry component. And may I have the next slide? We're also looking for application of heat and power in the domestic area. For instance, the first project is the, the municipality of Hoge Veen, uh, where um, a, a, a new build area will be uh, developed in which 100 new build houses will be fully hydrogen powered using fuel cells. And that will extend into a 1200 uh, housing block uh, using, uh, let's say, hydrogen as an admixture to the natural gas which is used there. We're looking for industrial heat applications in, in Emmen and in Del Seal, uh, actually using the, 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 the hydrogen as a green feedstock, but also using it as a, a feedstock for green power, just That's the fuel. Like you have one and a half minutes remaining. Okay, I'm, I'm running through it. We have some back hour systems in, in, uh, in uh, data centers and in onshore, several more running up to 300 tons per year. May I have the next slide, please? Uh, and also mobility. 10 buses on top of the 20, which Owen certainly will mention. One of the passenger cars will, uh, some heavy duty trucks, uh, several four to five fueling stations, and we have some inland barges which will be turned into hydrogen. In the next slide, please. And uh, also, we are going to look into the, the, the storage in the, in the salt caverns and doing all kinds of studies to make it more feasible. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, and this is a frightening picture. Uh, but in essence, these are four clusters in which 19 projects comprising the envelope of the Heaven project are being, let's say, developed. All over the scope from industry to mobility, housing, and, and, and um, uh, mobility. Me on the next slide, please. I had to run through, but we can never do this without public support. And the FCHU, really, we need to thank them, especially to help us to getting this done, and of course the European Commission, and I would like to say that if policymakers are listening, put in money into research and innovation and, and development, make it happen, we can do that, and we want to reach out, and we are very much looking out and for to uh, get connected to all the people around the globe who are active in, in green hydrogen. Thank you. That's an excellent ending to your talk, Patrick. Please put money in our project. Excellent. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Hank to talk about another of the projects in the, the Northern Netherlands now. Hank, could you please unmute yourself? 
Hank is the project lead of the North H2 project from the Khasumi. Yeah, good morning, uh, everybody in uh, San Francisco. You're on early rises. Yes, uh, on this moment, the end of business day almost. So happy to have this just small time slot to talk to you uh, and to tell you more about our uh, North H2 uh, project. As already mentioned by, uh, by Karin, uh, Gazuni is a Dutch uh, major gas infrastructure company uh, uh, providing gas transport services uh, in the Netherlands, but also in other countries in Europe and also providing gas storage services like the South Kevin as already mentioned by Patrick and LNG services. But uh, as also uh, introduced by Patrick, I heard uh, about the future. You can imagine that uh, when you, uh, so let's say, uh, two or three decades ahead, there's be really a big future also in hydrogen in our part of the world, uh, looking at the opportunities which are there in the Netherlands, but also in the international context in Europe. Uh, for that, uh, we also have uh, shared uh, and are partner with, uh, together with Shell in the North H2 project. And uh, other participants in the project are regional authorities, but it's really a very large project, even for Shell, I would say, I say also, so, so especially also for us, and really a huge investment uh, where we are going for. And for that reason, we also are now uh, expanding our, uh, uh, our consortium. So new partners will come up as well to make together this project work. work. Well, and what is it about, uh, this project? You see already, let's say, the, the infographic here. Um, it's really about a major contribution to the climate targets in the Netherlands and also in some parts of Europe. And also it's about to create in one go a full uh, supply chain uh, for green hydrogen in the market at a really uh, large uh, scale and an economic scale for the future. So what we think in the future as a scale which will work, let's say in the coming decades at this scale, we will uh, uh, realize this project. And uh, that also will enable uh, significant markets uh, to, uh, for, for uh, green hydrogen to develop. So it's a chicken and egg problem we have sometimes, affordable hydrogen, is it there? No, not, or not so much. It will be there and then the market can develop uh, as well. So that's basically the philosophy behind uh, the North H2 project. And if you look uh, more into what the project uh, uh, will be in terms of scope, um, it will be a full supply chain, as, as mentioned. So it will be part of the project is uh, are, are a number of large uh, offshore wind uh, uh, parks, which will be uh, uh, constructed, dedicated. Uh, so the electricity from the, the offshore wind parks will be dedicated for providing electrolysis, uh, which will then convert the electricity into green hydrogen. So all, all electricity will go to the electrolysis, you can say more or less. There will be also a nationwide transport system to transport the hydrogen towards all the major industrial clusters in the Netherlands and also some in Germany and Belgium. The rural areas mentioned here, for example, you see in the infographic. Um, and it will also uh, be a part of the, of the project will be, uh, uh, let's say, the first large scale uh, storage of hydrogen on a commercial scale, as mentioned. So also for uh, several players who want uh, to provide hydrogen to the markets. Uh, and then we, then we looked on uh, what we want to uh, achieve before 2030. Uh, this is quite early, I would say, at this scale, but we really want to have the first gigawatt of uh, uh, supply of hydrogen in place in 2027. And in total, before 2030, we want to have four gigawatts of uh, wind power in place uh, for this project, and that's really a large uh, one. If you look at the service we need, it's something like uh, 300 square miles that can be then put in the North Sea, uh, north of the Netherlands, north of the north of Netherlands, I must say. As Patrick has mentioned already, it, there's really uh, space over there to construct such uh, wind parks, but to give you an idea about uh, the service we, we, we need for that. Uh, it just would tightly fit into the San Francisco Bay area, let's say the area south of San Solito, then it will fit more or less, but then it will be fully occupied with windmills. If you look at the amount of uh, other service and the amount of windmills we, we need. And those are 12 megawatt uh, windmills, maybe even 50 megawatts, some of them in the second stage. Um, uh, and after 2030, we will further, uh, we plan further to develop the project uh, up to 10 gigawatt uh, between 2030 and 2040. 
So also before 2030, we need to have the electrolysis in place at a gigawatt scale. scale. Uh, as Patrick mentioned, uh, now we have projects of one megawatt. We have them by ourselves, 20 megawatts, maybe 100, uh, let's say a couple of years further down the road. But just a couple of years later, two or three years later, the first gigawatt electrolysis should be there in place. So it's really uh, some kind of, uh, let's say, uh, push to, to further scale up and to also to uh, uh, make the, 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 the full supply chain for, for uh, uh, making manufacturing the electrolysis at an economical scale and to have, let's say, the, the cost reductions in place in two or three steps with the first gigawatt, the second and the third one. So after we have, uh, let's say, uh, um, uh, constructed this four gigawatt, we need to have, let's say, the, the good maturity for large scale uh, electrolysis, which will also then be, uh, can be used for further development after 2030. Uh, also, I already addressed this gas transport. Uh, how can we transport this gas throughout the country in such a short time uh, with this kind of uh, supply? Uh, that's uh, some kind of luck we have in Netherlands, you can say, or luck with some other uh, circumstances as well. Uh, maybe you knew about the Groningen uh, uh, gas uh, production that will go down in the coming decade, but it was really the major gas field in Europe for decades. In, uh, in all over the world, it was one of the biggest even. But now that the production will go down to zero in three years from now. Uh, and there are also, there were, or there still are, a number of export contracts from Netherlands towards Germany and Belgium, and also towards further to the south. And uh, with these two parts coming together, there will be a pipeline uh, capacity will be freed up, will become available in the coming uh, four to five years. And it's not that it's one big pipeline going from Groningen, let's say, to the south of the Netherlands, or one other big pipeline going to the southwest, for example. But it was an incremental development in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So in practice, we are having four or five or some, sometimes six uh, pipelines uh, here in parallel. So if you would uh, uh, be able to free up, let's say, 20% of the capacity, you can just let's say, make one full pipeline available, full from the north to the south, to transport it towards other parts of the country. So that's a good opportunity, one of the good opportunities we're having for the project. And the other one was also already addressed, the, the storage in the North Netherlands. We have gas cavern projects uh, in, now already in place, and also possibilities to develop, to develop more uh, gas caverns in a pretty short notice, additional to what we already have. Uh, and these can be uh, used for uh, storage of, uh, of hydrogen, large-scale storage of hydrogen. And it's really what the project will need. But of course, if you are an industry, for example, and you need uh, uh, every hour of the year, you need uh, uh, hydrogen for your production process. Uh, there's not always wind on every hour of the year. So there's something like, let's say, half the time there is wind, uh, uh, maybe more than half the time. But sometimes it doesn't blow. The wind doesn't blow. Sometimes there is even more than you need. And for that, you can really use the storage as intermittents to get a good match between supply and amount of green hydrogen. So that's what the storage is about. And also, if you compare the cost of storage of hydrogen with, for example, let's say, uh, Tesla uh, batteries, it's a factor 1,000 cheaper. So let's say if you compare them both, then a, a battery on a common te technology with a good functionality will be 1,000 times more expensive than storing it as hydrogen in, in caverns. Thank you. And more or less, it is minutes and a half yeah. remaining. Okay, I will speed up. I'm almost ready. Yeah. Uh, the other one is in transport terms, uh, maybe also already addressed. Uh, uh, transporting hydrogen is a factor 10 or more cheaper than transporting electricity. So, also for that reason, uh, if you look at uh, uh, problems in the systems, uh, um, uh, then it is really a good solution to use uh, uh, hydrogen also as a means to transport energy. Especially it's coming more from the north where there's possibilities, but it's a little bit farther down from the market, away from the market. The north of Netherlands is a good place to start. So our headquarters in the north of Netherlands, of Gesney. The project is in the north of Netherlands. The regional authorities are very enthusiastic. And we're now rolling it out, let's say, to The Hague, the, the Dutch government, and also to Europe. And there are also very much positive reactions to that, to get this uh, project in place. But it's a little bit more further down the road, let's say, than the project uh, as heaven. Uh, which should be there, let's say, in three years from now or four years maybe. This will be the have the first uh, capacity in place in seven years from now. But it's very ambitious, very large, and we really work, have to work hard to get it done at that time. And we also need a lot of support, of course, from governments. 
uh, to get the market uh, value uh, for this product in place. Uh, but it would enable uh, really uh, big markets to, to develop further. And it would also be a kind of a breakthrough in the hydrogen market because then everybody has access to this uh, hydrogen, especially industries. We're now looking at industries to start because there are big steps in demand uh, we can expect. But of course, we have also a, sh a sharp eye on mobility, for example. And we expect that to develop gradually in the coming decades. So also for mobility, this supply can be used, this affordable supply can be used because due to the scale, we expect it to be uh, quite a number, uh, quite uh, significantly cheap, to be cheaper than, let's say, the smaller scale, which is now in place. But we need to have this staircase. Eh? So the current projects that need to be done in order to be able to scale up, let's say, uh, also in technology terms uh, or towards the scale which you have here. Thank you, Hank. So, um, I need to uh, ask you to wrap up. Yeah. But I think that's about it. I think okay. in the end, uh, the market can develop and the greenhouse gas emissions can be reduced with this project. Okay. Uh, and of course, we have to work to, on the market as well to get this uh, also in the market in place. But that is part of the project. So thank you, Carrie. Back to you. Thank you, Hank. We have uh, room for, for one or two questions. And there are some questions have been coming in in the Q&A box. Um, the first question I'm going to say for our um, transportation uh, colleagues um, after the next two talks. Um, there's one uh, question here. Hydrogen seems to be an excellent fuel for decentralized production. Could you comment on the economic considerations of piping hydrogen from Groningen to Limburg, for example, uh, versus producing it in Limburg? And I think this is a question for California, too, when we're talking about transporting hydrogen over large distances. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look to the... It's a question to me, uh, Karen? Sure, you can start. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, okay. Well, when you look to the Dutch context, I don't know whether it's the same in the California. So you have to look at every situation where things are located and where infrastructure is in place or where there are more, maybe more, uh, let's say, congestion uh, problems. In the Netherlands, there will be, and there is already some uh, congestion problems in the onshore transport of electricity north to south. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have electrolyzers in Limburg, for example, you really need big investments uh, also in electricity transport throughout the Netherlands. And if you can do the transport of the energy, let's say in a factor 10 uh, uh, more uh, economical, so a factor 10 more of course, if you do with electric with electricity compared to, to hydrogen, then it would be more wise to pick up, uh, let's say electricity on the, on the coastline or even offshore if you can, to put it, uh, to convert it into, into hydrogen, North and Netherlands where the electricity is, and then to transport it as uh, hydrogen towards Limburg, towards the South. In uh, system terms, that will be more economical, as we think. Thank you. Um, would anybody else like to respond to this question in particular? No. No, there's, another, there's actually another question that's specific to um, the infrastructure, and that is, um, does natural gas infrastructure need to be adapted? Can you pipe in the hydrogen gas, gas as a one-to-one -one replacement for natural gas? in residential use or other places? How do you see that happening? Well, if you would uh, build new pipelines, you will have big investments, let's say, in more than a million dollars per kilometer, uh, for example, uh, in the Dutch, Dutch context. If you would change, let's say, uh, repurpose uh, old gas pipelines uh, into hydrogen uh, uh, pipelines, then the cost will be much lower, you know, something like 10% or the magnitude. You have to clean up uh, the pipelines. You have to change some, uh, I don't know exactly the English word for that, but some applications on the, uh, on the pipelines. That's about it. It will be more expensive. You also have to uh, bring in uh, compression in the system because you cannot use the current uh, compressors uh, we are currently using for natural gas. So they have to be, re uh, let's say, restructured. And that could be uh, a more co a costly event. Uh, but in the end, uh, starting from existing pipeline infrastructure and uh, repurposing them for uh, hydrogen is really a good uh, uh, value proposition as we see it. Maybe I can uh, add something about also on the European level, uh, because next to the clean hydrogen strategy, there will also be a, a system integration strategy presented where uh, electricity and hydrogen are seen as uh, complementary energy vectors and that we need them for a resilient and a safe energy system in the future. Thank you. Um, that touches on another question regarding grid outages and wildfires. We'll get back, get back to that one hopefully in the wrap up 
Um, I do want to move on to the next speakers first. We're going to zoom in on the mobility side a bit more, and we're going to have Mr. Salvador Yamas first. He's the COO of AC Transit, which is my local transit um, company. Um, Sal, could you unmute yourself and please start? Yes. Thank you, Karen. Uh, good morning, everybody in California and San Francisco, and good afternoon for everybody in the Netherlands. I would like to uh, thank the California Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development and the Office of the Council General of the Netherlands in San Francisco for the opportunity to share AC Transit's experience with advancing zero emission buses. Next slide, please. So a little bit about AC Transit. We're located in, uh, in San Francisco Bay Area and has been serving the East Bay since 1960, taking over from the key system and its predecessors. Our seven board of directors are publicly elected members we serve about 1.5 million people in a 364 square mile area, which includes the counties of Alameda and Contra Costa, covering 13 cities and eight unincorporated areas of the East Bay. Prior to the pandemic, our transit service consisted of 158 local service lines and 33 trans bay lines traveling over three bridges. We provided over 20 million service miles with a bus fleet of 637, which includes 27 zero emission buses, supported by seven facilities located uh, throughout our service area and a workforce of 2,600, uh, excuse me, 2,268 and full-time employees. Next slide, please. So since 2000, AC Transit has been building the most comprehensive uh, zero emission bus program in the United States, arguably uh, by us, uh, initially focused on hydrogen fuel cell technology, and most recently expanded to include battery electric buses. Through a coalition of transit agency and industry stakeholders supported by federal, state, and local partners, AC Transit developed four generations of fuel cell excuse me, deployed four generations of fuel cell electric buses, each phase teaching us an important uh, improvement on procurement, operation, and performance of zero emission technology. During the demonstration period, we logged over 3.2 million miles of zero emission uh, operations. While exceeding many performance targets established by the Federal Transit Administration and the Department of Energy, Originally, the fuel cell power plant or power plants were guaranteed to operate for about 4,000 hours by the engineers. And thanks to our ingenious and creative uh, workforce, we operated fuel cell for more than 32,000 hours without any fa major failure and only performing basic maintenance on it and maintained the 13 bus fleet at performance levels equal to or above that of diesel buses. Through trial and error and many growing pains, AC Transit has improved the zero emission bus deployment process with enhanced project delivery methods and ongoing sustainable maintenance practices. One significant accomplishment was when our team spent weeks disassembling two end of life fuel cell stacks that were no longer operable and rebuilt them into one fully functional fuel cell stack, which is currently operating one of our buses. This is a tremendous achievement uh, that proves that now we're moving into the advanced stages of zero emission bus deployment. Next slide, please. Looking into the future, and thanks to the Federal Transit Administration and the California Air Resources Board, we received grant opportunities to further expand our zero emission bus fleet and purchase five battery electric buses and 10 hydrogen fuel cell buses from the same bus manufacturer, New Flyer, and our goal is to have a true side-by-side -side evaluation of zero emission bus technologies operated by the same agency in the same service environment and built by the same bus manufacturer. Next slide, please. So performance, um, ZEP Performance Evaluation 2020 is AC Transit's comprehensive analysis of public transit bus technology that will include battery electric bus, fuel cell electric bus, diesel hybrid, conventional diesel, and legacy fuel cell bus technologies. 
we will assess and compare capital costs and annual operations and maintenance costs of the various bus infrastructure technologies. We established working with our IT department, automated data collection of performance, reliability, cost matrix on off leaks independently and will, will be combined into a comparison report. Zeb Eval 2020 will provide valuable information as we prepare to embark on the future towards transitioning our fleet to 100% zero emission. Stay tuned for official reports that will be released once we stabilize operations. Next slide, please. So trained and skilled zero emission bus mechanics are not readily available on the job market. This will be a, a big hurdle for the transit industry that will require we rethink how we package zero emission bus training with bus procurements. Equipment manufacturers will need to provide the training aids and tools required to advance the skills of our workforce as zero emission bus technology continues to evolve. Working with technology partners and implementing the lessons learned for more than 20 years of experience, AC Transit developed training curriculum to kick off an ambitious zero emission bus university training program. We developed training curriculum on high voltage battery, electric drive motors, fuel cell power plants, and high pressure gaseous fuel systems. Mechanics start by learning the basics, safety and familiarization of components on the zero emission propulsion system, and then progress to preventative maintenance, basic diagnostics, and advanced diagnostics. We also created a hands-on technical experience program where mechanics are assigned for up to five weeks to our zero emission bus uh, trainer and administrator, where they learn how to perform preventive maintenance inspections, diagnostics, and repairs. And they also, we bring in another cycle of mechanics two weeks into it, so the, the students start to become the trainers and they work together to really ensure that they're grasping that knowledge. So far, AC Transit has trained over 513 mechanics and provided more than 20,000 hours of zero emission technology training. And we also train every operator and a lot of our uh, management staff on the zero, zero emission bus technology. Next slide, please. On June 10th, I'm very excited to announce that AC Transit's Board of Directors adopted a resolution approving our zero emission bus rollout plan, which outlines the district's goal for a full fleet transition to zero emission technologies by 2040. The building blocks of our plan include several initiatives. We completed a zero emission bus study that evaluated the current state of zero emission bus technology and projected options to transition our bus fleet by 2040. We also, uh, our board of directors adopted a clean corridors plan which identifies 13 corridors that travel through disadvantaged communities to be prioritized for zero emission buses as we acquire them. The plan calls for a little over 500 buses to be deployed in these corridors. And looking beyond- remaining. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, I'm wrapping it up, <laughs> thank you. Looking beyond 2040, uh, we develop a facilities master plan to look at the, the capacity at all of our facilities. So some of the lessons learned that we are still um, there are still many unknowns and unexpected changes to overcome. Some of them are deployment of, of zero emission buses and infrastructure as a significant capital and operating cost. Procurement of ZEBs now require careful timing to deliver infrastructure capital projects with, uh, with ZEBs so they can align and arrive at the same time. And uh, uh, ZEB operation is vulnerable to utility company priorities and limited fuel supplies. Uh, and ZEB technology is evolving at a rapid pace which uh, com complicates operations and maintenance capabilities of components and infrastructure. But without a doubt, zero emission buses are already available. However, in order to successfully transition, we will need to find solutions to these challenges. Next slide, please. This concludes my presentation. I wanna thank you again for the opportunity and back to you, Karen. Thank you for that um, comprehensive overview. I think you guys have a really impressive um, operation. We're going to hear from um, Ervin Stoker next, who is a, one of your one of the counterparts in the Netherlands, um, head of development for public transit in the Groningen Drenthe region, which is in the northern Netherlands. Ervin, if you'd like to unmute yourself. 
Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about uh, the zero emission bus scheme we have uh, in the north of the Netherlands, uh, which is not only about hydrogen, but is about uh, battery electric bus buses as well. Next slide, please. Can I have the next one? Yes. Uh, well, we already know where uh, Groningen and Drenthe is located in, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, thanks to the previous presentations. Uh, uh, some numbers, uh, about 1 million inhabitants, uh, and uh, we have about 360 buses uh, running there. Um, and passenger uh, uh, evaluation is a 7.7, .7, which is for people from the north of the Netherlands, a uh, quite high number. Uh, next, please. Uh, in the Netherlands, we are faced with a challenge that we have a zero emission bus agreement where uh, we agreed that all new uh, public transport buses uh, to be put into service from 2020 onwards have to be zero emission uh, and all public transport buses have to be zero emission uh, from 2030 onward. So that's a very ambitious scheme and we're working on uh, making it possible. Next, please. Of course, we have the uh, hydrogen economy uh, in the north of the Netherlands, which uh, makes us one of the possible uh, uh, users of the hydrogen, uh, which uh, is already supplied uh, in the region and will be uh, uh, vastly expanding in the near future, as you heard before. Next slide, please. Uh, that's why we already started in 2017 running two hydrogen buses uh, as kind of a pilot to uh, 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 to uh, uh, be able to do some uh, experiments in regular operation, uh, uh, like the diesel bus, uh, as in California with AC Transit, we wanted to be uh, uh, as flexible uh, with the hydrogen bus as with the diesel bus. So range uh, of over 300 kilometers. Uh, and uh, uh, from the uh, chlorine factory of Nurion in Del Sal, uh, use of uh, green hydrogen. And of course, uh, some uh, European funds uh, helped developing this pilot as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is an overview of the chemical cluster in Del Sal, where the two buses are fueled at the Nurion plant. Uh, we're running about 65 kilometers, 65,000 kilometers per year. Uh, so that's uh, quite a lot. And uh, most of the time that a bus is not available is because of a demo, because we get a lot of demand for demos uh, from uh, all over the Netherlands, uh, where they want to see and touch and feel the bus. Uh, and in that way, uh, well, we try to, uh, to make people more enthusiastic for, uh, for hydrogen. Uh, driver training is, uh, is also a, a, a big challenge because a hydrogen bus is something else than a diesel bus, uh, but that goes for, uh, for electric buses as well. And we started with a dedicated group of drivers, but from December this year onward, we will have uh, 22 uh, buses deployed in Groningen and Drenthe. And then all thousand drivers from Groningen and Drenthe will be able to drive the hydrogen bus. Next slide, please. Can I have the next? Yes. Uh, when it comes to uh, hydrogen uh, and electricity uh, in buses, uh, well, there's always a mix uh, you have to, uh, to find. Uh, we had a tender uh, for the 2020 to 2030 period where we uh, already wanted to set the first steps for the zero emission uh, transition and where we um, uh, said that for shorter distances, uh, battery electric buses are mandatory. So for city buses and also for bus rapid transit systems around the city of Groningen, uh, it was mandatory to uh, provide uh, electric buses. Uh, and for regional buses, uh, the uh, public transport operator market was uh, uh, challenged to uh, provide as much CO2 remission, uh, emission reduction as possible. Um, and also, uh, uh, it was mandatory to run uh, some uh, 22 uh, hydrogen buses uh, in total. Uh, next slide, please. And what we ended up with uh, is something we were very um, uh, uh, surprised uh, with uh, because uh, the operator offered us a total of 90% CO2 reductions in 2020. So the uh, buses running now uh, are uh, emitting 90% less CO2 than uh, 2019. And that's possible uh, because out of the 360 buses we have, 186 buses are zero emission already. 
Uh, so that's 22 hydrogen buses, and we have a total of uh, 164 uh, electric buses being uh, implemented uh, or have been implemented uh, this January. Next slide, please. Oh, and that, uh, that also is the biggest zero emission bus implementation in uh, Europe uh, at this moment, until Gothenburg uh, uh, is coming in uh, next year, I think. Um, this is the uh, Pantograph electric bus for uh, the bus rapid transit system we have, so full electric. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also have full electric buses for uh, the uh, city buses, uh, both articulated and 12 meter buses. Next slide, please. Uh, for the regional buses, so the longer distances, we uh, also got some full electric buses, some 60 buses from the Dutch manufacturer Ibusco uh, for the shorter regional routes. Uh, and for the longer regional routes, uh, the current operator is also offering diesel technology fueled by uh, hydro-treated vegetable oil, which leads to a, a high CO2 decrease as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this year, December, uh, you will have um, uh, a hydrogen refueling station installed at our bus depot uh, in Groningen, where some 120 buses uh, are stationed and some 20 buses will be put there to run on regional routes uh, and consuming hydrogen. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the buses will be van holes as well, uh, the same as uh, AC Transit is running uh, uh, at the moment. Uh, and uh, the hydrogen is provided uh, after a European tender by uh, Shell, uh, some 110 to 160 tons of green hydrogen uh, per year, uh, a tender for uh, tank-ready uh, delivery at the nozzle. Uh, and that will begin end of this year. Next slide, please. When you look at uh, the north of the Netherlands, we have a total of five projects uh, uh, prepared. The two hydrogen buses uh, in Del Ciel, uh, you see in the upper right. Uh, then we have the 20 buses coming in in December uh, this year in the Groningen depot. Uh, in Emmen uh, in 2021, uh, there will be 10 buses implemented uh, as well, together with the uh, HRS uh, that will be uh, constructed there uh, as well. And then for the longer term, we have uh, two long distance coaches projects. Uh, number four is the project between the two cities of Groningen and Emmen, uh, where we'll have uh, hydrogen buses uh, on the regional routes, uh, traveling up to about 1,000 kilometers per day per bus. And uh, we're also involved in the Coach 2 project, uh, which is a project also financed by the uh, FCHAU uh, to implement uh, uh, hydrogen on uh, uh, coaches as well. Next slide, please. Uh, that leads the way to other uh, applications as well. Uh, we see some taxis coming in right now. Uh, we see uh, small buses coming in right now. And also uh, for the city of Groningen, a big scheme into uh, the, the uh, waste uh, trucks and the city sweepers uh, are uh, being implemented as well. And as you can see, our uh, national, uh, our uh, prime minister is very interested in this as well. Next slide, please. Uh, some uh, in, uh, investigation is being done to uh, convert the regional train system, where we have about 50 trains uh, running on diesel uh, still, the last diesel trains in the Netherlands. Uh, there's discussion about converting them to uh, hydrogen as well. Uh, and we had a pilot uh, last year where one hydrogen train was running on the regional tracks uh, quite successfully. So uh, we're looking into uh, converting more trains into hydrogen trains. Next slide, please. Sorry, Aaron, you have, you have one minute remaining. Apologies. That's too much for me, I'm afraid. Um, because when it comes to, uh, um, uh, to zero emission bus transport, uh, it's not a matter of choosing between electric and hydrogen. It's a matter of choosing the right energy source for each purpose. Uh, so that's both. There's a place both for electric buses and for uh, hydrogen buses in future, uh, all depending on uh, the application you want to to use it for. Next slide, please. And I kindly invite you all to uh, come uh, and see for yourselves in Groningen and Drenthe. So everybody uh, is invited to to come there. Uh, next March we'll have a. Uh, big uh, reunion of all European parties uh, in the European projects uh, considering hydrogen and uh, I would like to invite uh, everyone who uh, 
is able to come then, uh, corona uh, pandemic uh, provided, to come and see for yourselves what we're doing uh, in the north of the Netherlands in creating uh, a base uh, uh, demand for hydrogen uh, from a government side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erwin. Um, thank you for your talk. That was very interesting. I think um, very um, both the Netherlands and California have very ambitious goals for zero emission uh, transport. That's very obvious. And I, I liked uh, Salvador's comment that actually the rapid development of technology is a, a challenge for you. You would think that's a, and we're all thinking about, it's great to have technology development, but I understand with implementation, especially the larger projects that you guys are doing, that that can form a challenge. We had a question very early on in the in the uh, webinar um, for transit agencies looking to procure ZEBs in California to comply with ICT regulations. What have feasibility studies shown in principle in terms of the principal criteria and drivers for choosing a fuel cell versus uh, BEBs? I'm assuming that's battery electric buses. Um, I think you've both touched on it a little bit, but Salvador, would you like to take this one first? Sure, absolutely. Thank you. That's actually, a, it's a great question because that, that is where transit agencies really need to understand what is their profile of service. So what AC Transit did was we actually um, worked with the Center for Transportation and the Environment to do a study where we looked at all 158 lines that we operate in Trans Bay lines to look at the topography and the, the different impacts on what would draw energy from the motor. And that's what's going to determine the range uh, needed and uh, how long the bus would have to remain out on the road between charging or refueling or re-energizing. So based on that, we realized that there's certain routes that a uh, battery bus with the current technology can actually uh, be deployed on. And then there's some routes that there's absolutely no way that a battery bus is going to do it unless we invest in uh, in-line, uh, in-route charging, or we change our route structure, which we, we're not going to do that. So I think that's uh, education on the technology and how it lines up with the uh, the actual profile of the routes is very important. That's the starting point for us. Thank you. Erwin, do you want to add? You're, you're looking at both as well. Yes, uh, I, I think Salvador uh, uh, has a very good point. Uh, it's the same for us where we looked into, uh, well, the, the best uh, zero emission, uh, let's say, technique for each uh, uh, category of uh, buses we have. And uh, as I said before, uh, electric buses is, uh, battery electric buses is uh, uh, easily implemented in uh, uh, city uh, environments uh, where you have uh, short lines, uh, low operational speeds. Uh, you can also, what we did is uh, for the uh, bus rapid transit system, where you have uh, very, very high frequencies on a certain line, you can invest in charging infrastructure at the end of the line. That's what we did as well. Uh, but for the regional routes, uh, you have to find another solution. And, uh, well, for now, hydrogen, though uh, uh, still a bit more expensive, uh, uh, is uh, doing the job uh, when it comes to providing the, the service you need. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for both your answers. Um, one more question here, and then we'll, we'll do a, a very quick wrap-up. Um, who manufactures the fuel cells for your buses? And do you see new parties coming online? Um, developing more uh, technology. <laughs> um, um, to Salvador first, who, who are you working with? Yeah, so the, the legacy fuel cells were manufactured by uh, UTC, who was no longer in the fuel cell business, but our modern ones that we have today are manufactured by Ballard, uh, who has a world leader in fuel cell technology development and has been an excellent partner with us. One of the pictures that you saw on our training, uh, on my training slide, was a um, training aid where we actually have a full functioning fuel cell that we can use to train our mechanics, um, at, just like we do with our diesel engine. So um, I do not know that there, there's other companies out there that are they're started the process um, and for whatever reason have not really um, put the uh, the product out in the in the bus manufacturing market. So for us, it's Ballard. Thank you, Ervin. Yeah, it's the same for us. Uh, we see that okay. Ballard uh, is very strong in the public transport uh, industry. Uh, you see some other uh, parties coming in when it comes to uh, other applications as um, uh, cars, and, uh, but also uh, heavy-duty uh, uh, vehicles, uh, trucks and so on. 
But for now, I think Ballard is the, the main supplier for the buses uh, that we see. Thank you. Um, there's there's one other question um, that maybe to all, and then that will be the end. Um, unfortunately, of this very interesting webinar, uh, the first of more to come, hopefully. Um, it's a question about the um, resiliency of the system and energy and hydrogen's place um, in um, um, a resilient energy system. So are there policies and economic drivers in place that acknowledge the benefit of hydrogen for resiliency for mul multiple sectors, supply vectors and intrinsic storage? This was a question early on as well. Um, to anyone, maybe um, anyone like to take this question? It's kind of a broad question. Yes, well, I briefly mentioned about European policy, but also in the Netherlands, we want to support uh, both electricity and uh, hydrogen and in all sectors in industry and mobility. Uh, we really see the synergy between uh, uh, the vectors uh, necessary for a resilient energy system. Anyone else? I think this... Uh really fits in with the uh, with, with some of the things that were said earlier that as you build hydrogen into multiple sectors, including heavy duty, it will drive up the supply of, of the fuel, but also make it more available and bring the cost down, hopefully in a broader sense, um, and will generate multiple producers. So I think that is very important. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for keeping to time. You were excellent speakers. Um, any additional questions, um, we will, um, um, distribute amongst ourselves and try to answer online um, and get back to you. This is a recorded session. It will be um, posted online for binge watching later in the weekend. And um, for now, thank you very much. And we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.